Welcome back to The Debrief. And while the screen says 2021, we are a couple months into the new year. And while the season is about to start, we're going to take a look back to uh, the season that just passed the Olympic season. And in an idea that I'm sure many people have had and we've talked about for a while, we're actually going to do some competitor awards for the season. Um, we've seen some other competitor awards in the last couple months that have been pretty objectionable and kind of bonkers. Uh, congrats to, to those nominees. So we figured maybe we would get some... Uh, some journalists that follow the scene from the beginning to the end of each season and discuss who we think uh, the best of, uh, of the year were. Um, joining me today, as always, John Bergman, uh, covering all of the comp scene for climbing uh, and gym climber, I think, and then, of course, author of uh, uh, High Drama, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing. Uh, also, Eddie Falk of The Circuit, uh, climbing, who is finishing up the details on his uh, on his big tell all book, right? It's all tell all, no photos. It's just text. No, no, no photos. It's all incriminating <laughs> text. Yep. No, no one's ever going to talk to me again. Perfect. Eddie, of course, was on the circuit for uh, what was it, 20, 2014 until uh, until twenty twenty. Uh, trying to remember the years. Well, I mean, yeah, and of course, I'll be back for a second. I thought you were going to say I was on the circuit for twenty years. I was like, no, no, no. no. <laughs> I was on the circuit, um, 2013 to 2020, 2015 to 2020 was official photographer. All right. And of course, more to come. He will be back when he can sort out his bum leg. Uh, and then, of course, Natalie Berry is the editor in chief of UK Climbing, uh, writing up the most in-depth briefs of each competition each season. Uh, so if there's one place to go to to learn every little detail, I got to stab John in the back. Natalie's are always a few thousand words longer. Uh, John will try and beat that record next season, I'm certain. So uh, that'll be some fun stuff to watch out for. But anyway, it's the best possible panel to, to discuss these awards. So real quick, the awards that we're going to do, we're only going to do four of them, uh, and I'll explain the methodology. The four awards we're going to cover are uh, Rookie of the Year, Breakout of the Year, and then Male Athlete of the Year and Female Athlete of the Year. Uh, so they're all competitor-based. And the way we did this is the four of us all nominated our kind of top four nominees individually for each of those categories. We then kind of reached an average consensus of, uh, of what the, the top four of each category was between the four of us. And then once we had that list of four for each category, we all kind of as a team just divided up those nominees. And for each category, uh, some of us will be arguing on behalf of the favorites. Some of us will be arguing on behalf of the, uh, the kind of the, uh, the least favorites of those top four. So if you have any complaints, if you think that somebody's missing, just be aware that we only allowed four into the nominations list. And if you think there's maybe somebody in the list that should absolutely not be there, well, we required four nominees, even if some of them are a little bit nonsense. Uh, and we are going to do our best to present good faith arguments for each athlete, even though if we think there is a much stronger case for someone else. So uh, so just take this as a, a celebration of all the athletes that we're presenting. Once we present our arguments, we'll actually have a chance to talk about it, about how we actually feel about all of them. And we will uh, hopefully not not have any tie votes. We probably shouldn't have chosen a panel of four people to, to vote on something this contentious. But hey, we might just have ties all the way down, two versus two. So anyway, our first category, if, uh, if everybody is ready, is Rookie of the Year. And we define this as a uh, award presented to the competitor participating in their first year of senior international competition, irrespective of gender or discipline contested, judged to be the most outstanding of the 2021 season. And uh, our first presenter for this is going to be Natalie Berry. Uh, who are you uh, arguing on behalf of for Rookie of the Year? I've chosen Oriane Berton of France. Um, purely because she's only 16 years old and there was a lot of pressure on her, a lot of expectations, I think, because everyone's seen what she's done outdoors, like really hard repeats and first ascents on eight sea boulders. And I think everyone was expecting her to be, you know, giving Yanya a run for her money, but you never really know what's going to happen in competitions. <laughs> so I think the way she handled that pressure and that level of expectation was really good. Like she came second in Myringen, her first ever senior World Cup, not only to make finals, but to make the podium 
and be hot on Yanya's heels. That was really impressive. Um, and then she followed it up in Salt Lake City with another second place. So talking about, you know, making a really good impression and just jumping straight in and getting straight to the top of the leaderboard, she was, yeah, no, I don't really, I think it's quite rare for especially a female athlete to do that. Like since Yanya, I don't think there's been many athletes who've gone straight to podium in their first <laughs> World Cups. And then the week after in Salt Lake City, she was fourth. So again, three finals, three World Cups, two podiums, two silver medals. And then unfortunately she did <laughs> peter out a little bit after the first three Older World Cup, she came 16th in Innsbruck, and then as the summer hit, she just seemed to lose that run of form for whatever reason. Maybe she was getting tired, maybe you know, the adrenaline of those first few competitions just took it out of her. Um, and then ultimately, she came 41st in the Moscow Boulder World Championship, so she did kind of tail off. But I think if we're looking for like a rookie debut, she had such an astonishing debut and there wasn't really anyone else this season that I could think of who made such an impression. Um, I think also her performance was really important for the French team because they obviously had a really tragic loss of Luce Duardi in 2020 and maybe it sounds wrong to say it, but I think in some ways Oriane was kind of following in her footsteps and just kind of carrying on the baton of like young French females like Luce made her first fight in her first World Cup she made finals and there was a lot of kind of parallels and I know that those two were really close so it was just really nice for the French team to have an, another young female star um, make such a strong debut I think and also I love her climbing style like she's got a no holds barred kind of go for it attitude just kind of like Yanya um I think at this point she's maybe sometimes a little too enthusiastic, sometimes on last moves. Um, she loses her composure and maybe she just needs to kind of get a bit of maturity in her climbing. But hopefully that will come. And yeah, I was just blown away with her, really. And she seems really friendly and smart and gets on with the other girls, quite mature for her age. So yeah, I was a fan, basically. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to try not to defend other people's arguments, but the, 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 uh, the idea of, of needing a bit more maturity in their climbing will probably come up with everybody in this category. So I appreciate you bringing that up. I'm going to argue on behalf of Alexandra Tokova, um, another young climber. Um, but in this case, unlike Orianne, who had a very flashy beginning and then absolutely fell off towards the end of the season, Alexandra Tokova stayed much more steady, uh, basically keeping um, hit semifinals in every competition that she attended, albeit she stayed in the lead discipline, uh, whereas Orianne was kind of in between the two of them. Um, in particular for me, the big thing is Bulgaria has such a big climbing history, but in sport climbing, they have played host to a lot of different events, but this is really the first time that a, uh, somebody under the Bulgarian flag has uh, podiumed and, and earned a medal in competitive sport climbing. And I think that's a, a massive deal for a country that is such a, a huge influencer in the construction of climbing walls. Uh, but also just they've played host to so many events in the past and they were a real booster of sport climbing uh, through some of the hardest times of sport climbing's history uh, in the early days and also in the days when, when the number of events on the calendar was really low. So I think just from her uh, representing the country that she comes from, it's a really special thing. Um, and I do place more value on the fact that she was very steady. She made finals in three of her five appearances. Uh, she did earn that bronze medal, and I think that's a bit more impressive than the Orianne route, which was hot right off the top. But again, those very first World Cups, remember that those are the first World Cups uh, in bouldering that we've had for a couple of years. And the route setting was probably the least dependable, most uh, most uncertain that we've ever had after such a long break for the uh, for the root setters and competitors. So I think she may have taken advantage of a really kind of wobbly uh, playing field. And maybe that was a bit of a fluke. I'd be interested to see how Orianne holds up in the next couple of years. 
But for the sake of this argument, I would say that Alexandra's performance uh, through through the lead season was more impressive and more consistent than Orianne, who may have depended on uh, possibly some easier sets to get those medals. And yeah, uh, me? is it me? Yes, John. John, okay. you're next. Um, yeah, I'll, I'm going to be making the argument for Kiro Mao. Kiramal Katiban, Indonesia's Kiramal Katiban. And we we can talk about rookie of the year or rookie of the season, but I think we all know with Kiramal, we're really talking about one one race, right? It's the the race at Salt Lake City, his first adult IFSC competition, even though he he was 20 years old, it was his first adult competition. He runs a, a 5.258 and and breaks the men's world record and so when i'm making a case for him i kind of it, it almost feels like university debate class or something here i think you can you can go down the pathos argument and then you can go down like the logos sort of the logic argument here so first of all let's I just need talk a, I about need a definition of terms sorry i'm i'm okay. out of my depth with, well, with whatever first Latin of all we're bringing up or greek i don't know what that is <laughs> Let's just make the logical argument. Let's just talk about the exclusivity of the result itself, okay? We have seen before, it's rare, but we've seen it before where a rookie does really well in World Cups. And we've it's rare, but we've also seen, it's even more, it's rarer, but we've also seen rookies win World Cups. Case in point, Che Un So a number of times in the 2019 season. I think Adam Andra won a World Cup in Barcelona his rookie year, you know, um, back in the day. But how many times have we seen a rookie set a world record? So let's go through them. Reza, when he set the world record in 2017, not a rookie. Before him, the men's world record, Daniel Boldarev in 2014, not a rookie. Women's division, uh, Alexander Miroslaw at the Olympics last summer, of course, we know, not a rookie. Before her, Kaplina uh, in 2020, not a rookie. In 2019, Aries Susanti Raheyu and before her, Yiling Song, neither of them a rookie. Anuk Jobert before them, 2018, not a rookie. You can go on and on. The point is, this has never been done before, that a rookie sets the World Cup. I think that right there should end the argument and and make it uh, uh, unanimous for Kiramau because this sport is contingent on setting yourself apart from other competitors in terms of accolades, in, in terms of awards, exclusivity, all of that. And he's in a class of all by himself. It's just, there's just one. But aside from that, let's switch gears and go to the, the I don't know what you'd call it, the emotional heft of the moment, just like the intangible quality of it because you can go back to this very show years ago where we were talking about the indonesian men um being particularly strong and, and expected to do good things in the in the speed division i think albert oak was actually on the show i think it was like early 2020 where he actually said hey man watch the men's the men indonesian speed climbers they are coming for that world record and he said, he, I think he predicted, he's like, they're going to break it, the world record, and they, they might even break five seconds. And so obviously, there's been a lot of hype behind what Kiramal did. There was years worth of hype. And the fact that he lived up to that and broke the world record is incredible. But I also remember being there at Salt Lake when he did this. It was, like I said, it was at a qualifying round. So it was I think it was in the morning. Their seats were very empty, as they usually are for qualies. I remember like going up to the front row right in front of the, the speed wall when he was setting up, getting ready to do this run. And I looked around and saw all these empty seats. And I thought, these people, the people that aren't here, the people that chose not to come, are crazy. Because we're going to see a world record right here. It's going to happen. There was just like, there was just this this intangible buzz. And I, you know, Eddie and Natalie, I don't know if you were at the events when Yanya uh, did the the streak in 2019, won all the bouldering events. But I wonder if there was just that same kind of buzz at every event where you feel like, yeah, you're a part of something special here. We're about to see history being made. Obviously with, with 
Kira Mal, it was just one comp. It wasn't a whole season, but it was just really special to be to be there and to feel that you were about to see history being made. And then he did it. Um, so history's made. He lives up to the hype. The only thing I'll add, and then I'll I'll shut up here, is that I think he also kind of started what might be the dawn of a new era in men's speed climbing because the Indonesians were not at every comp this season, not even close, but the few that they were at, they were head and shoulders above everybody else. And now I don't know if that's because maybe other teams had trouble with international travel and couldn't make it to the events, but it looks like the team to beat is Indonesia. And I think that you can kind of, trace that problem somewhat back to Aries in 2019, but, all, but especially to Kiro Mal in 2021. All right, Eddie, who's last. I, I don't know how I can compete with that argument. That was so strong. Let me, let me pop one thing in that intangible buzz that John was feeling was Albert Oak, just breathing heavily beside him into his ear saying, it's going to be under five. It's going to be under five. That was all well, it was. Nobody else felt let, anything. It was just John having to deal with Albert having a panic attack over the in like impending. Uh... I I will say it was crazy being there because you would see that an Indonesian men walk and Albert, you know, he's he would like put he's like, oh, there they are, there they are. It was like they it was like you were seeing the Beatles or something, right? It was just it was wild. It was really cool. It's interesting to me for as someone who's been so in the sport to hear the perception of someone that you're involved in the sport, but you don't get to see it live every day. A lot of what you see is recorded. And quite often you do get that buzz around qualifiers for different events, especially with young climbers coming up and you're watching and you're one slip away from not being on the rookie of the year list effectively. And so it fascinates me to hear you in that excitement and go, well, if you had access to the first qualifiers that Ariane was in or Yanya was in or Mejdi or anyone like that, would you get the same feeling watching them and knowing that they had to perform at that level? Because of course speed also has that concrete thing about it that the other disciplines don't. Speed has, is so tangible compared to the other disciplines. Um, you can watch a bouldering comp and someone will top all four boulders in, or sorry, all four, five boulders in qualifying you're like, oh, wicked, they're going through. And then a bunch of people flash all five boulders, and you're like, oh. <laughs> so with speed, you do 5-2. You're like, yeah, you're probably through to, probably through to finals. Um, I'm going to talk about my rookie who's not a rookie. Um, so I got the twist, who is, of course, the legendary, in his own mind, Colin Duffy. And so... Colin technically isn't a rookie in that he did one competition in 2020, but then the world fell over. So yeah, let me let me clarify. We for rookie we basically drew the line at you had to compete in a IFSC Senior World Cup or World Championship. So the the Olympic qualifiers, all that kind of stuff, Continental Championships, that stuff doesn't count towards our definition of rookie. If anybody wants to complain about it. But of course, that also gives me my ace in the hole because my rookie is the only Olympian here. And not only is he an Olympian, he's an Olympic finalist. And to make finals in your first senior year at the Olympics ahead of people like Alex Magos and Jan Hoyer and people like that is just, it just shows the potential that is to come. And if you look at his season through the World Cups, that may be not truly indicative of where he could have been if he'd just been focusing on World Cups. Because whereas every other rookie we've discussed has been looking at the World Cup circuit, one rookie, Colin, has been looking at the Olympics, which is a whole different ball game. His training's going to have been different. He's going to have been focused on the three disciplines, not just his favoured discipline. And... You know, if but for a false start, I think it was in the speed. Maybe he's not seventh in the Olympics. Maybe he's in the medals, and then you, you know, and that's the wonderful thing with rookies is rookie and inconsistent just go together. I mean, 
Natalie has said about that with Oriane. Uh, Tyler said about that with Tokova. Although you, you you kind of played her consistency well, I will I'll give you that, Tyler. And you know, as much as um, Caramel is, was amazing, I, I don't know that two events at which a third of the speed field was there is a is a big enough sample size. Mind you, I'm I'm being even worse because I'm playing one event, which is the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, because you know, if I look at Collins World Cup results, he got on the podium in Villar. Uh, so second ever lead World Cup, he's on the podium. That is phenomenal. But it wasn't his focus. So that was his only podium of the year. And if you look at him in this class of rookies, you go, well, he only got one podium. That's not maybe his flash. I'm like, yeah, but he got one podium and then made finals at Olympics. I mean, that's not too shabby. I This is going to be a recurring theme with all of this is, is – uh, measuring kind of how much do we weigh the Olympics as an acceptable excuse for poor results in the other events. And I understand that you're trying to peak for a particular time of the year, uh, specifically the first week of August, but some, like some of the results that, that Colin ended up fielding, like he did come third in that, in that one lead world cup, but he also came like 20th or 21st in the other lead world cup that he competed in. Um, he had some not at all impressive bouldering results uh, for somebody that, uh, although I, I think of him as a lead specialist, maybe if anybody wants to correct me, but that's how I've always kind of thought of him. Um, but his bouldering results weren't, weren't that particularly uh, uh, strong. So I, I have a little bit of trouble like excusing result discrepancies that are that large and, and explaining it away by saying that well they weren't trying to peak at that point um i can i can give a little bit of leeway but that's kind of a lot for me is when they're they're way down in the double digits not even in semifinals. i i guess my answer to that would be we never saw what tokova or the others would have done if they had entered a different discipline they had the privilege of only focusing on their specialty uh, even Oriane Baton, who is an incredible lead climber, only focused on Boulder. And so they came in as rookies. And, and you see this as the rookie channel. Um, the classic example is Yanya, where they steer the rookie into an area of strength and they try and mentally equip them for the future by giving them tangible improvements and results that they can look back and do well you know you got to remember when Yanya came out they limited her in the first season mm -hmm. to four world cups because they just didn't want to tire the wee girl out at 16 and so the difference between that and someone who's going in and they go to salt lake home crowd pretty much like you know second world cup ever and they're expected to pull onto the speed wall and uh, you know that's daunting um and so i think you know i i personally i give them a lot of rope if they've got to do all three disciplines because i think you're you're exposing your vulnerabilities way more than the other three athletes are let's uh let's talk about where we personally fell in our own opinions aside from the arguments that we had to make um i know when we were talking about the nominations for this my initial my starting point was Oriane. I was all Oriane. Uh, Kiramal started to enter that math because of how big a deal that uh, a, a world record uh, crushing in your first race of your first World Cup. That's just incredible. And given that the speed season was so short, this is a, a plus and a minus. It became the dominant speed story for basically the entire year and a huge what if when we received no more speed cups after uh, Villar. Um, I think Alexandra was was really fun especially in the later part of the season to watch but i i still put orian and um kiramal towards the top and i i'll be honest i think i am leaning actually more towards uh orian at this point i was kind of disappointed by how many events she kind of expected herself to do um it was something that she talked about not just at the end of the season but earlier in the season talking about how much uh how much travel and how tired she was um, I know she mentioned it uh, a few different times. And so those first couple of events in Maringen and Salt Lake City where the field was 
I think, pretty strong. She had incredible performances all three rounds. And and I, I mean, I was we were hyping her up from the very first day, maybe too much, but she lived up to it, frankly. Um, and and coming second to what Yanya wants and, and Natalia wants. Um, yeah. That uh, that's that's pretty damn good, and I think I, I would still lean towards Oriane uh, in my own personal vote at this point. Yeah, I think also she came third overall, even though she didn't do that many competitions. She still yeah managed to get a medal in the overall. So yeah, it felt like we didn't see that much of her towards the summer season, but she still managed to claim a medal. Um, I think I'm quite persuaded by Eddie's argument because I did have Colin on my list as well when we were going through them all. I think the Olympics, you know, being a rookie at the Olympics does also have the advantage of being the underdog and you're not really having that much pressure. Nobody really knows who you are. You're just this cool kid that somehow made it to the Olympics in the only competition in 2020. You know, it's a great story, but I think people weren't expecting him to win necessarily they might have thought he had a really good chance but he just went out there and yeah climbed his heart out and didn't seem to get nervous maybe when he made the final and then made a false start in speed that's where it started to sink in and maybe that's a sort of growth point for him in the next few seasons in the next olympics um but yeah i think overall i'll stick with Ariane given how strong she was right off the bat in those first three competitions. Natalie, how do you, or anybody else, I suppose, that's leaning towards Oriane, I, I, when I think of her season, I mean, obviously we're all four here. We're all big fans of hers. Uh, when I'm thinking of her season, there's kind of the, the yeah, but, right? Which is that she started phenomenally, but she did have, as you explained, she she really trailed off there at the end. And maybe hindsight is twenty twenty. Maybe it would have been better if she had done something like Eddie explained that Yanya's trainers did in just having her just do a having Orion just do a, a few competitions and then ha- and then call it a day for the season. The fact that she did stay on for the full season. I when I'm assessing her season, I can't help. But I mean, I, we can't just disregard the fact that she did not do nearly as well at the end in those, um, which, f- for one thing, makes it really curious the start of this season. I want to know: Are we going to? Is this going to be Orion from the beginning of 2021, starting 2022, or are we going to see Orion the version of her that we did at the at the end of the season? That'll be really interesting to see. But how do you all? I don't know what the right word is, not justify or whatever, but just when you're assessing her season, what do you do with the fact that she did trail off significantly there at the end with the results? Well, the one thing, the one thing I do want to mention is like her performances in the lead world cups weren't exemplary, but you are talking about some semifinals appearances that you would, if you were to say, Oh, name an athlete that's going to earn medals in Boulder world cups and then become like mid semifinalists in lead. You're talking about athletes like, uh, um, a Miho Nanaka, or if you flip the disciplines like a Laura Regora, right? That's, that's a, that's a high level of praise to be earning medals in one discipline and then be doing fairly well in semifinals from another. So the it's I I agree I as I mentioned I agree that it was a, a dramatic fall off from somebody that it was just nonstop hype those first couple World Cups it felt almost inevitable that a gold medal would uh, would creep up that season um, if if I zoom out and kind of get rid of the hype that that uh, surrounded her early on it's a pretty respectable like uh, a season that we would accept from people that we consider stars at this point. Yeah, I think I agree with what you're saying, John. I think I did see a post by Orion on Instagram saying something how like she, I struggled to find my flow in lead this summer or something. Like she wasn't very happy with her lead results, didn't seem to, maybe there's something psychologically going on that she didn't feel that comfortable on the wall. So maybe that had something to do with it. I also wondered, given that she's such a keen rock climber, maybe she was climbing outdoors a little bit more in the spring summer maybe that impacted her training we don't really know but yeah maybe that's an element or maybe she was just so pleased with how she did in those first competitions that 
pressure was off and she could just do different things and try lead, try rock climbing. Maybe maybe that's what it would come think down. I think one of the things for me is with the Rookie of the Year award, it's kind of our opportunity to attribute excuses to climbers. Because as a rookie, you have that leeway. Um, and I think for everyone we've nominated, there are those excuses. You know, Katabin was amazing, but we never Getting got to see if, <laughs> yeah, we, ne- we never got to see if he was going to dip. You know, if, if you only took the first two comps of Orianne's season, you'd have a very similar argument. So, you know, it's, I, I feel that the sample size was too small. You know, um, Tokova, really impressed with. Um, she surprised me probably most of the people on the rookies list. Um, and I know I came in barracking for Colin, and I think what Colin did has been fantastic. Um, but my rookie of the year is probably Mejdi. Oh, I mean Ariane. <laughs> <laughs> He'll always find a way. <laughs> John, well, to be honest, I thought um, Mejdi is worth a mention because men's bouldering is such a stacked field that you can't guarantee consistency right up to the very elite of the men. So for Mejdi to come in and even feature in the conversation, I think is, for instance, to me, that's close on a level to the, the others we're discussing. And I know he didn't quite make the cut in this, but it's still honorable mention time. We're going to run so long if we do everybody's honorable mention. So I'm going to cut it off right there. <laughs> and uh, I, so I, let's just go around really quick. Where's everybody at? I think, I think Orianne, I'm settled in. Colin, for me, the, the, just to wrap up my remarks on him, was I think, you know, earning an Olympic spot just from the North American qualifier when he wasn't really expecting it. Um, so I think of him in a different vein than the other Olympians. But then the performance that he actually did in 2021 – I've mentioned this before. I I have a lot of trouble thinking of the Olympics on an equal plane in terms of the value of the climbing. I think culturally and for the sport, it has a tremendous amount of value. And he performed generally well at the Olympics, particularly in qualifiers. Um, but I, to me, the the uh, the climbing that we saw through the season is more valuable to me. So I I place Orian as my rookie of the year personally. Um, Natalie, I think that's where you fall as well. Um, John, I haven't heard what you thought. Yeah, I think I'll have more to say on on the Olympic stuff as we go forward with other awards. But I think at this point, for me to weigh an Olympics kind of on equal playing field or, or just like up against a World Cup accomplishment or a World Record accomplishment, I think I'm wanting to... Um, I, it would have to be like an, an Olympic medal, quite frankly, rather than just saying like this person made it to finals or something like that. To take nothing away from from the accomplishment in making finals, it's it's really cool that Colin did that. But um, I would I'm I'm leaning towards Orion as well. Um, and uh, let's see who else. Kiramal. I as much as I I made the passionate argument, I did want to see him in more than just two races. I think it would be hard to give him an overall season award when he only did that twice as spectacular as he was we need a little bit of quantity to go with the quality there so yeah orion for me as well eddie where do you fall? yeah orion oh that was easy all right cool wow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, we'll give the credit to Natalie for the convincing uh, for the convincing <laughs> argument. Uh, so, uh, rookie of the year, according to these four talking heads, uh, is uh, Oriane Berton, and uh, she is not on the line. She is not in studio to accept an award anywhere. So, uh, somebody will just have to uh, text her and say that uh, some people that she may only know by name have given her that uh, sick prize. All right, let's move on. Uh, that that took a bit longer than I expected, but whatever. We'll just roll through these. Next category is uh, breakout of the year. We define this award as uh, being presented to the competitor, irrespective of gender or discipline, judged to have made the best or most significant breakthrough over the 2021 season. A little bit vague, 
but I think this is one of the most interesting uh, discussions because it was a fascinating year. And uh, this one, we're going to have uh, John Bergman lead off. Who is your breakout of the year? <laughs> Sorry about that. I was muted. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, I think the breakout was Natalia Grossman. 20 years old, Team USA. Let's recap her results a little bit. She she rockets onto the scene uh, in a big way. Third place at Mayringen in bouldering. And she follows that up with back-to-back -back golds at Salt Lake City, which I think right there, you could stop right there and 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 the argument could be made that she was the breakout anyway, because in the process of uh, winning the second of those Salt Lake City golds, she beat Yanya Garnbrett, and anytime anybody can do that, they're worthy of, of some serious discussion. But on top of that, as if that wasn't enough, for the rest of the, she the season then, she proves that she's almost just as capable in lead, in the lead discipline, as she was in the bouldering discipline. She gets third place at Villar, second place at Chamonix, second place at Briançon, third at Cron. I mean, it's just like podium after podium. And concludes the season um, almost going double gold at World Championships. As it was, she gets first in bouldering and, and second in lead, which is um, incredible in its own right. So um, I think she's deserving of being the breakout star, not only for the results themselves, but also because several of those results entailed beating Yanya, who many people consider to be the greatest of all time. We'll table that discussion. That's a whole other debate. But um, I can also say that she is, Natalia is, she is the comp superstar in the United States right now, so, at least in the women's division. And it was interesting to, to have the Olympic build here in the United States. And there was so much focus initially on Brooke and Kyra, the Olympians. But then there also developed this other narrative where you would even see articles written where people would, when talking about the Olympians, would, would have to mention Natalia because she was so good and because she was developing such a fan base. There was this whole other kind of subculture of Olympic journalism about like, hey, why isn't Natalia Grossman in the Olympics? And so I don't know if you can say that she stole some of the Olympic spotlight from Brooke and Kyra, but you could certainly say that she stepped into the Olympic spotlight, just kind of like being uh, conspicuous by her Olympic absence in a way. Um, so those are the reasons I will put forward. I, I will say just on a, on a tangential note, there's a big what if for me with Natalia, which is what, what would her have season have been like in 2020? What if we had had a full world cup season in that year? Because if you look at her 2019 results, She's like 23rd and 53rd at the two disciplines at Worlds. She gets a 17th at Moscow. She gets a seventh place. So in 2017, in 2019, she was clearly on a like a, a notch below where she is now. And I can't help but wonder, like, oh, I wonder if this amazing run would have started in 2020 for her rather than 2021, since we didn't get a, a 2020 full season. I don't know. That's just that. Like I said, that's just kind of like a side curiosity, but. Um, yeah, Natalia for my breakout star. Eddie, you are next. Oh, well, I've won this one. So um, you guys can <laughs> move on because I've got Alberto Guinness Lopez. And I mean, ooh, 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 breakout ooh, ooh, star. Ooh. Let, let, let's just list, it off, list this off. Spain's most famous speed climber ever. <laughs> um <laughs> Spain's most famous climber ever. Up there with Spain's most individual, you know, he has gone to, he is outside of climbing now. He is a recognized athlete. He has been nominated, you know, the IFSC chose him. And you've got to remember the IFSC is the font of all knowledge in this sport. And they said that above everyone else, he had the breakout season of 2021 when they nominated him for the World Games athlete of the year he was their athlete um and then laura sports awards you know last time a climber was nominated for laura sports awards alberto was in nappies 
it's been that long till we've had a breakthrough on the international stage so big that a climber is recognized as yeah a a cross sport athlete you know he is a global su superstar so i mean results aside you look at his season results it says one in tokyo and in ter there's nothing more breakthrough than your first ever senior victory being a gold medal if you look as well and if you remember our narrative earlier last season was all he's doing too many world cups in the lead up to olympics everyone else is taking time to rest and this Alberto kid's just charging. He's doing everything. He's competing in Brion Son. Most of the other athletes are on the plane. And it worked. It worked. You know, so, I, yeah. I mean, bye. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> I like how he's so confident in his argument, but at the same time, undercutting himself with unbelievable sarcasm for a few of those points. So I don't even know what to make of that. But well, well argued. Uh, I'm going to be arguing on behalf of uh, Sean Bailey. Um, now, unlike Natalia Grossman, uh, he managed to win events in more than one discipline, not just in bouldering. He uh, he also won uh, gold medals in lead climbing, and that's we're talking like some serious Adam Andre Jakob Schubert style shit. If you are winning golds in two separate disciplines in the same season, that's a huge deal. And you might say, well, you know, he's won a medal in the past. He won silver back in 2018 in Vail. But I respond to that by saying what American hasn't won a medal in Vail at some point. It's basically just, you know, par for the course. Doesn't mean anything in particular. It's just a standard thing for any American competitor. Somebody should probably investigate that, how every American boulderer has a Vail medal somewhere in their uh, in their trophy cabinet. Uh, so, Sean, now, Alberto, the, the problem for Alberto with me is his better season was in 2019. In 2019, he won a bronze, he won a silver. That's when he came of age, the first time he got to see him uh, in that year. He was a huge deal. He was all of this promise. Um, and I'm a huge fan of Alberto, so I don't want to knock him too hard, but his season was rougher than 2019. Uh, he had, I think, the uh, – uh, was the was his only podium – the uh uh no not as yes his only podium this season was was the gold yeah uh he did have oh. some finals and managed to disappoint uh every time i mean go, that's go not ahead, completely Eddie. true he did he did make the um he did make the podium in combined in the european youth cup i mean he only <laughs> came third but um you know i i think you know if you're gonna have one gold make it the olympics I, don't don't we cannot get into this okay pet peeve the, here is <laughs> on the ifsc broadcast when they they talk about like youth world cups as if it's on par with an adult world cup They're like this person's <laughs> won you know 10 world cups and you're like yeah but five of them were youth not to take that it's all respect to people that win the youth world cup the youth cups but we cannot say that they are on the same plane as uh as adult world cups <laughs> They're two steps removed, continental and kids only. Uh, but anyway, back to back to wrap up my argument really quickly. Um, the Alberto thing, unfortunately, his gold medal is going to be marred by his own shock that he won that medal in the first place off the luckiest speed round in the history of all speed. Uh, what was it? First of all, uh, was it Colin Duffy that he, yeah. So Colin Duffy false starts in the first round. He manages to get through where he faces somehow all of a sudden top seed Adam Andra because Basamawan drops out to injury. Adam, the actual bottom seed gets through to the next round. So he has to beat the, basically the lowest seed in all of the Olympics. And then when he gets to finals, Tomoa Narasaki, the notorious Tomoa slip where he can't even nail the beta that he created. Uh, means Alberto gets the first. So I, I, I take issue with Alberto's uh, Olympic victory as being all that impressive. But lastly, just quantitatively talking about Sean, uh, is that I think his climbing in the season was actually really impressive. The bouldering victory in Salt Lake City was a super hard finals round. And the problems that he succeeded on were what you would think of as the most typical modern Japanese style bouldering, this dynamic movement where it really was about dialing the precise amount of momentum and distance. And he absolutely destroyed Tomoa and Kokoro on those problems. Problem number one and problem number four, the only problems that were sent 
Uh, he did an excellent job hovering through that campus sequence on men's one and on men's four, the only one to top it and, and getting one of the biggest applause as we've heard in a really long time, uh, sticking the lateral kick off the, off the volume into the jug high above, uh, the kind of problems you would expect, uh, the Japanese team to ace. And it was Sean who actually did all the work. And then when it came to the lead comps, I think the, uh, it was at the Chamonix, one in particular was that extremely difficult finals route where none of the climbers even got onto the head wall. Uh, and Sean made that techie bouldering style look excellent. Finally, his gold in Villars, where it was against Alex Magos and Alberto. Uh, and maybe Colin was in that field as well. Uh, one of the most fun climbs from a viewer perspective of the season. And he cruised it. And some might say that maybe it suited his height better than others, but I thought his climbing was was awesome through all of those comps. The golds were well-deserved. Uh, and because he won gold in two separate disciplines in the same season, uh, to me, he is uh, is the, the better breakout. And I'll leave it to Natalie to close it up. Yeah, I'm going with a maybe slightly biased choice, a fellow Brit, Hamish MacArthur. <laughs> Also, someone who can who managed to achieve on both senior and junior planes last year. He obviously won two golds at the World Youth Championships in Moscow, in Boulder and Leeds, and came silver, got silver in the combined. He was also seven in the World Championships in Moscow, senior World Championships. He came third, just really close behind Jakob Schubert who, yeah, there, there were two tops, and Hamish just flipped the last move, sadly. Um, so really close to possibly becoming world champion in his first, like, senior world championships. And then seventh, he came seventh in the bouldering at that same event, so lead and boulder to come top ten. Like, he missed out on the finals in boulder by one place. Um, that was really impressive, and I think everyone in Britain was... Quite sur- well, not surprised because we know we've got he's got great potential, but that was definitely a breakout performance from from a British climber. Um, you know we've got the likes of Will Bosey, Shauna Coxey, and you know nobody's really jumped that far up the rankings in one of the first. I think it's only his second or third senior season, but it was quite a jump compared to his previous results. Um, after that, he did a couple of World Cups where he was more like midfield. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see what he does this season because he's training really hard in Leeds. It's become the new Sheffield in the UK. He's training really hard with Max Milne, um, who was Boulder World Cup finalist in Salt Lake City. So those two are a really strong combination, great training partners. Um, and Hamish has declared in interviews that he wants to win both Olympic Games, Paris and Los Angeles. So I'm really excited to see what he does next. I like how Natalie had had the balls in this case. Most of the time we're trying to hide the fact if we have the bottom seed, but she just came right out and said, you know what, this was my choice too. I wanted this. <laughs> and I think in the nominations, did you have a combination you nominated did you nominate him with Alex and Max to try and <laughs> anyway? Yeah, it, was a... <laughs> it, it, it was one of the most biased nominations for sure. One other international, <laughs> but they, they were three British breakouts. So yeah, I'm biased this one. You can discount my opinion. <laughs> I I quite like your opinion. I just think that it happened just a little bit too late in the season when you already had some other people who kind of claim the headlines. And I think maybe there's a little bit of post-Olympic fatigue in the viewing audience. But his late season was a breakout. I mean, by definition. Mm-hmm. I thought yeah. his commentary in Chamonix was very good and maybe the highlight of his season. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, for instance, Tyler, you, you had Sean Bailey as a breakout. And, I mean, that guy's had more breakout years than, like... <laughs> You know, I, I remember being there for his first or second breakout year in 2017, and then his next breakout year, and was it 2018 that he made five? You know, he... he... Can, can we agree this was his most breakout year so far? He just keeps breaking out beyond his previous breakouts? Like, you know, it's the first time winning gold. Silver's cool, but that was like three years ago. Yeah, maybe. Anyway. Yeah, I mean... 
don't get me wrong. I'm hoping I, nobody I would, remembers I all the different him. episodes where I've ragged on how Sean shows so much promise and then drops off. And we've talked about that for years. Hoping nobody remembers that as my like my default thoughts of him. But yeah. So listening audience, go down. We'll put timestamps below of all the times that Tyler's ragged on Sean. Sure. <laughs> Until uh, we get to limits. <laughs> let's let's talk about where everybody's at with this. Um, I kind of went first first time around so let me hand it off to uh can i eddie can i send it to you like your first impressions of uh of, of who you think is the is the breakout yeah natalia so um go ahead mainly because she hasn't had a season that's really put her on the map previously she had made a final in um veil but she was kind of like without meaning to be demeaning to her she was like brooke's friend and kind of a periphery figure and from the start of the season she was in no way a periphery figure every competition she came into she was on everyone's lips so i think in terms of breakout event i would say alberto has the breakout event in terms of breakout season i think natalia has the breakout season Natalie, I'm curious what you thought about this, um, because you a question that I've had in my mind and I'll, I'll flesh it out later is is trying to measure how uh, trying to trying to measure like that public breakout uh, that our climbers had from the Olympics. And I know you kind of looked at that a little bit. Did you have any thinking about like how to uh, how to quantify like the kind of audience that uh, somebody like Alberto has seen compared to before the Olympics or anything like that? Yeah, I did do something on this on UKC. I think it was like how many thousands of followers that people had amassed on Instagram. Um, I'm just thinking. But I think I like what, um, like what Eddie was saying about there being a sort of metaphorical, like, breakout. I like how you interpreted the breakout as in climb, breaking out of climbing into, you know, the public sphere um, after Tokyo. Um yeah, the increase in Instagram followers, there were like thousands. <laughs> I'm just trying to find the article. Um, yeah. Well, let me let me just put a put a question out there because I'll just say where where I've been thinking, and we'll come back to Natalie for the numbers. Was the the breakout designation is 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 extremely vague, and when it comes to Natalia versus Alberto, which are the two top in my head, is I think Natalia is on the lips of everybody that watches competitive climbing. Um, if you are somebody in this scene, you're an audience member, or even if you're just a climber, John mentions, you know, in the YouTube chat, it's why isn't Natalia at the Olympics? She was the story for the entire season because she was earning medals at every single competition that she went to. It was an extraordinary season. Uh, but for Alberto, regardless of what I think about what it took to earn that medal, that that stage that he performed on was hypothetically so much larger. And I do have a lot of questions about how many people actually watched sport climbing. And I do have questions about, you know, uh, depending on which country you're in, how much will you see of Alberto after the games are over, right? Like I'm sure in Spain, he, he could be all over everything, but in other countries, if you didn't watch the event, you'll probably never hear that name again. Um, so I've been trying to balance the two because they're both such different uh, arguments for the for the award. So I've got the stats here. So in the period of 10 days following the Olympics, or following that event, sport climbing athletes gained around 700,000 Instagram followers in that 10 day period. The impact of being a finalist and having that extra bit of exposure was even greater. Alberto Hines Lopez got a plus 342% increase from 38,000 to 168,000 followers. Miho Nanaka attracted the most followers at the women's field, plus 100,000 followers. Yanya, plus 82,000. Um, women's accounts gained slightly more than the men's overall. But yeah, overall, there was a plus 18.69% increase for all the athletes in that 10-day period following the Olympics. John, what do you I'm think? gonna oh, sorry, sorry go I'm gonna duck out for 15 seconds. I'll be right back. Yeah, no problem. So John, John, John you can start. I uh, it's too bad Eddie's leaving because I actually kind of wanted to 
piggyback off of something he said, which is I, I I mean, everybody who listens to this regularly knows how much of a fan I am of Sean Bailey. And I think he is deserving of some award for this season, but I don't know if I would, I don't think I would put him in the breakout category for, for, I, I don't think that would be the award that, that I would give him because you look at, like you said, Tyler, he's won or he's earned a world cup medal in the past he is a national champion in the past, meaning prior to last year. And on top of that, he got a lot of press and, and kind of buzz from, I don't know what we'd call it, the out, kind of the outdoor climber dirtbag crowd, because he sent a biography you know, a while ago, Chris Sharma's famous, um, famous route realization or whatever. So I feel like there was... <sighs> I don't know. It's like he never really had his breakout season per se, but I feel like we are at a point now or we were in 2021 where we were, we were somehow beyond his breakout season, even though we, he never actually had kind of that inciting moment, that season there. Um, I just don't think, I, I just think it's really hard for me to call him a breakout star Especially, I mean, here in the states, I can say he was he was a huge star before this World Cup season before before twenty twenty one. He was uh, n- n- probably not as famous as obviously not as famous as Sharma or Daniel Woods, but like uh, very close, like in the sort of the next whatever you'd say, the next tier below them in terms of fame uh, for being an American climber. He, I would think, he was already there. So it'd be tough for me to put him in this particular category. I'm leaning towards. Um, probably Natalia Hamish Hamish you make a really good argument for him though um, Natalie and I think what's was really fun was how heading into this season we were thinking okay the big story with the Great Britain team is going to be Shauna's retirement and this this season is going to be all about her retirement tour and the accolades that she deserves and stuff like that and yet because of Hamish and because of Alex, like there was this whole other storyline that emerged or a number of storylines that were really cool that we didn't expect going into that. So that was pretty fun. Okay. So where, where do you guys stand uh, in terms of your, your uh, like who you would vote for at this point? Eddie seems pretty solid with Natalia. Yeah. I think as I said, um, before I got distracted by the stats, I think um, Eddie's argument about breaking out is really interesting. You know, into the public, sphere and climbing just getting so much more notoriety um you know more press and coverage in the news but i think like eddie and john and you i think natalia just she was on another level in the world cups last year and quite unexpectedly and also as john said there was this of subplot of like why how is she doing so well and she's not in the olympics like what's good where's this gonna go like surely she'll be in the next olympics and that was all really interesting to follow and it was nice to have that as a kind of separate as a subplot to the olympics when we were all getting really excited about that we could also keep an eye on what she was doing and see the future really of women's bouldering and lead climbing because she's good at both it seems so yeah natalia (laughs) and john is that where you landed as well yeah, I'd have to vote Natalia for this one. Yeah, I, 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 this is the probably the one of the most difficult categories for me, but it sucks because I feel like I'm trying to measure entirely different things, like Natalia versus Alberto. Like I, I, as a climbing fan, I think Natalia's season was far more impressive, but Alberto, I, I, I feel like I don't want to want to, uh, um, I don't disrespect's not the right word, but I don't want to minimize maybe how big of in uh of a, a profile boost he he got internationally it's just extremely hard to measure i feel like from where i am his profile hasn't been boosted at all i don't hear about him aside from endemic climbing press um so i i've just been trying not to uh minimize the fact that he performed really well on on such like the biggest stage we've ever had uh but my my gut feeling was originally in Italian. and i think i'll stick with that um, so, uh, yeah, our, our, our breakout and Eddie, I, I, sorry, I was assuming you were sticking with Natalia. You seemed very convinced right off the top, right? So yeah, breakout competitor of, uh, of 2021 goes to Natalia Grossman. Congratulations, Natalia. Uh, okay. Two more to go. Our next, uh, award is going to be for male competitor of the year. Uh, 
this award defined as uh, being presented to the male competitor, irrespective of the disciplines contested, judged to be the most outstanding over the 2021 season. Uh, and I'm going to have to take a, a John style approach to this. I'm going to be nominating uh, Vedric Leonardo, uh, the Indonesian speed climber. Now, John told a really romantic story about uh, Kiramal at that first event uh, at Salt Lake City, how right off the bat, first race of qualifiers, Kiramal breaks the world record after a four year, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 break from from any major changes to that world record time. Uh, but the thing about uh, uh, Vedric Leonardo is he's the one that actually ended the event with the world record. Uh, Kiramal, unfortunately, will likely not go down in history for this particular event. Maybe he'll break it again in the future, but that record fell a couple times in that first event in Salt Lake City. And ultimately, uh, Vedric had to race against his teammate Kiramal in the finals, where uh, Vedric broke the record even further, uh, leaving it where it stands today. Um, and then in the second and final Speed World Cup of the season, Le uh, Vedric also looked uh, uh, very convincing, beating the entire field once again. So earning double gold, basically sweeping the season. You could kind of say it's equivalent to Yanya sweeping the Boulder season in 2019. Basically the same thing, right? Same amount of effort. Uh, unfortunately, because the season was uh, cut so short, technically uh, it doesn't count as a full season. And so he doesn't win a speed overall uh, trophy like you might uh, for previous seasons, which is really disappointing considering how exciting the speed season started. It could have been a really incredible year. Um, but my argument for, uh, for Leonardo is that all of these athletes had the COVID break to prepare for this season of speed climbing. Uh, all the Europeans, everybody out of the CIS, everybody out of Asia, North America, everybody had that break where they could look at all the beta that was being uh, modified and uh, grown upon by the Olympians, all these boulderers and lead climbers who normally wouldn't give attention to speed climbing. They're all adding their contributions to this sport and making improvements and in all these ways that the speed climbers hadn't innovated in the past. So everybody had all this new information and incredible new examples of how to grow as speed climbers, and they had extra time to do it. And as it turns out, when we got to the events, the only people that were regularly breaking this world record was the Indonesian team. It was Kiramal and it was uh, Vedrik. Everybody else, all those huge names uh, out of Europe, uh, they were, uh, two of them managed to break the former world record uh, at Villars. I think it was Dimitri Timofeev and uh, uh, Slava Dulin, I think. I, uh, but anyway, it only happened twice outside of, of Kiramal and, uh, and uh, Vedrik. And so they're the ones that seized this opportunity to focus on something. Um, and again, most of these speed climbers that I'm citing were also not going to the Olympics. So what excuse did they have? Uh, everybody's focusing presumably on Paris as well. Um, and so my argument being that the world record is one of those few tangible uh, things in climbing that you can break that people will remember forever. Um, it's not often you get that kind of accomplishment in a single bouldering World Cup or a single lead World Cup. And Leonardo came out, broke that world record. He holds the new world record and he managed to convincingly beat all of these climbers like John Brosler, Rishat Kaibulin, an Olympian, Vladislav Dulin, Dmitry Timofeev, his teammate and former world record holder, uh, Kiram al -Kadubin. He did it in both of those events, uh, looking excellent in all of them. And he is, in my opinion, going forward out of this season, he is the torchbearer for the excellence in men's speed climbing. He's the guy to beat. Uh, I think the Indonesians are going to be seen as the favorite from here on out, right? That's I can't imagine any other country right now has anywhere near as much hype as they do. And if anybody thinks they are going to break that five second barrier, it's going to be him. I think his performances were excellent. He made almost no unforced errors, save for I think one qualifying run in Villars, which had apparently very slippery walls. So I can probably forgive him. Uh, and I think he stands out for having just uh, uh, achieved something that with so much build up to it, he was the one that seized it and actually got it done. So my vote is for Vedric Leonardo. Um, next up is Natalie. My vote goes to a legend of the game, Jakob Schubert. He's 31, um, which is only a year older than me. I'm not trying to make myself sound old, but he yeah. won 
Michelle, so old, Natalie. <laughs> he won bronze in Tokyo. And, you know, I don't think... He, he was so disbelieving when he lowered down from that route. I don't think he knew exactly where he was placed. And I was stood in front of the wall and he lowers to the ground. He's like pumped up because he's topped the route and then looks to his coaches and they're holding up three fingers. And he's like, third, third. Like he couldn't believe it that he'd got the bronze. And, you know, that's at the time I thought, oh, that's probably his last Olympics, but I think he's going for another one. But yeah, it was just a really special moment. He's such a good championship climber, as was evidenced just a few weeks later in Moscow when he won gold in Leeds. He just always seems to be able to pull it out of the bag in these big events where, where some people go to pieces. He just has this championship game and just manages to win or medal in most of the one-off events that he competes in, including the Olympics. And then, but even in the run-up to the Olympics, he seemed to have quite a good season. It was a short season, but he was third in Salt Lake um, and first in Innsbruck on home turf in lead. So lots of pressure there for him, but really good confidence boost before Tokyo. Um, I interviewed him after after those two competitions and just before Tokyo, and he he was feeling really confident and he shares a flat with Michael Pickle Ruetz and he was saying, yeah, Jakob's had a really good start to the season. Um, hopefully it'll pay off in the Olympics, but you never really know what's going to happen. And yeah, I, I, I was so blown away that, you know, one of the older guys, all these young up and coming climbers, um, Jakob still managed to fend them off on the biggest stage in the world and, he just always seems to pull some trick out of his bag, some card to manage to win. Whatever he needs to do, he can do it. Like he needed to beat whoever it was in the final and manages to top the route. And then, yeah, no words. I was just so impressed with him in Tokyo. And next up is uh, John. Yeah, I appreciate the eloquent words there by uh, Natalie because a lot of that same uh, Olympic stuff applies to who I'm going to make the argument for which is Alberto Hines Lopez um, kind of I, I can just sort of dovetail with some of the stuff that that Natalie said about the Olympics and the importance of that event to a competitor and stuff like that I we we've said pre in our you know discussion of the previous competitors we said okay so this season wasn't Alberto's best World Cup season. His 2019 was better. Looking at his results from 2021, he was, um, let's see, seventh at Briançon, 14th at Chamonix, fifth at Villars, another fifth at Innsbruck. So it it was not a legendary World Cup season. But I, in a way, I I don't think that matters, quite frankly, for in, in, for choosing him as the male athlete of the year. Because let me ask you some rhetorical questions here: How many swimming World Cups? does michael phelps have i don't know i don't even know if there is a swim world cup but how many track and field world championships does usain bolt have i don't know right like the the the, the point is people know those competitors be, because of the olympics that it to the masses the olympics are really all that matters for some of those sports now we can that's a whole separate discussion whether that's good or bad for, for the sport of climbing, but I do think it's inevitable that climbing could get there decades from now if we continue with Olympic inclusion, where the Olympics will be the thing, the accolade when assessing climbers. Like I said, I don't, not that that's necessarily a great thing, but that's a different discussion. The point is, as time goes on, Alberto's accomplishment of winning the gold is only going to become greater and greater as we have more Olympics. 30 years from now, 50 years from now, when you're looking back on the Olympic history and the heritage of climbing in the Olympics, there's going to be, it, there's just something magical about who was the first. And in a way, I think that's great because World Cup, it's, it's kind of the opposite of a World Cup medal where you win it and it's fantastic, but then you move on from it really quickly because there are other World Cups that happen and stuff like that. And that, and that one World Cup win just kind of, 
sort of fades into the past. And I think that that's going to be the opposite of this win for Alberto, where the, the World Cup or the gold medal at the Olympics is just going to become brighter and brighter and, and more important, and more legendary and all this stuff as time goes on. It's almost like the story around his Olympic win is just going to get greater and greater as time goes on. Um, so I, I, I think he deserves to be the male athlete of the year. Let me put it a different way, and I'll end with this. For going forward forever, 2021 for climbing is going to be the Olympic year. That is how it's going to be talked about. I mean, Tokyo 2020 slash, you know, 2021, right? Like, it'll be a weird discussion. But <laughs> point is, th this, this year we're talking about was the Olympic year. And it's always going to be that way. And I think because of that, you have to look at, well, who were the Olympic gold medalists? And you have to give them a lot of weight. And so, Alberto. Eddie, I'll leave it with you to wrap up. All righty. Um, well, Natalie actually took the old dog award for calling Jakob at 31. Um, I, I, so I'm going for the Married with Children award, um, <laughs> which is Kokoro Fuji. Um, because I do think Kokoro Fuji had the strongest season of the World Cup climbers dash World Championship climbers this year. I mean, you know, we're talking about a climber that's had more breakout seasons than Sean Bailey here. And when you look at him, he has always been the guy that everyone in the sport knows, but that isn't quite Tomoa, isn't quite Keita Doi, isn't quite Yoshiyuki. He's he's the ultimate other guy of Japanese climbing. But he is also an incredible climber. And this year he came out, every World Cup he was in the finals, two fourths, two seconds, incredible consistency across a range of countries, a range of conditions, and ends up tied for the overall for bouldering with Yoshiyuki Ogata which he then loses that tie on count back to best result, but still same number of points. And it's only a shame there weren't more comps to really show what he had. So he had one more comp to show what he had. And that comp was world championships. And that is the dominant athletic performance of the season to me across every discipline, across everything I saw was Kokoro Fuji's round in finals at the, at not at the Olympics, should have been at the Olympics, uh, not at the Olympics, at um, World Championships. When he came out and just cruised that boulder, which no one else had moved on, and you just, you could tell all that pent up, energy, emotion, rage, passion. He just climbed perfect. And so for me, when I look at what the climbers have achieved this year and I go, well, again, Kokoro, even though he manages to be world champion, still manages to be the other guy, even though he manages to get equal number of points to the winner of the World Cup overall, still manages to be the other guy, but he's not the other guy. He is an absolute machine and yeah i think for me he was my male climber of the year all right um i i have such a such a strong desire to pull out some of the also rans on this one but we'll we'll leave it at the four that we decided on as a group uh let's talk about where we uh where we fall off the top of uh, of our heads our, our first inclination uh, uh john i'll start with you in this case uh, where where are your feelings at? This is a really tricky one. I, I think this is the the award that I'm having the most trouble um, landing on one name and being sh certain about it. Um, so I think I could be persuaded, but I just kind of keep going back to the logic that I said, which was this is the Olympic year, and so it's it's it just would feel strange to me to give the male athlete of the year award to somebody who was not the Olympic gold medalist. And I understand that that comes with a lot of complications because like we said, Alberto did not have a very good 
by 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 Olympic gold medal standards, right? He did not have a great World Cup season. Didn't have a great but, Olympics by Olympic gold standards either. I don't well, know. There well yeah, other more convincing right. Olympic gold medals, but yeah. <laughs> but it just it just it would feel too weird to me in the when assessing the Olympic year to not give the award to the Olympic gold medalist. So I think in this award, I value um, the cultural significance uh, the least. Um, there's there's those dogs. <laughs> Sorry, it's all good, man. Uh, so so the Olympics thing, I have an easier time refuting that angle for this award than I did for breakout of the year. Um, I am very believing in how valuable Leonardo's performance was uh, this year. And that award could or uh, to Vedrick's uh, performance this year, and that's the kind of thing where, depending on on how uh, uh, little races here and there could go, we could be talking about uh, Kiramal in this instance. Uh, but because of the combination of the world records uh, and how dominant he was, along with his teammate, um, I think that the two of those Indonesian speed climbers were kind of the male competitive story of the year for how. They took the discipline to an entirely other level that it seemed like nobody else could match. And I have to give the edge to Leonardo because he was the one that got the gold medals and he's the one that's going to be in the books uh, as the guy with the world record from this season. Um, Jakob, I think he was probably one of those people where you say he had the most effective uh, season plus Olympics combined. Um it was impressive that he decides to do one lead comp for the season leading up to it and he wins it. He takes his hundred points. He doesn't do any other comps. So, you know, a huge what if. Um, and of course, he was one of the the great stories. I think all of us as climbing spectators, we were so proud to see him up there because you feel like he's just inherently deserving uh, of winning an Olympic medal. And then I think the, the argument for uh, Kokoro is, is extremely compelling as well. Um, the world championships topping off uh, an exemplary World Cup season, which was more consistent if seeing less gold than somebody like Yoshiyuki. Um, I'll be honest, I, I this is one where I, I fully agree with the argument that I got to make. Um, I'm leaning towards Vedric Leonardo for this one. I like Eddie's argument about Kokoro with the always the bridesmaid, never the bride kind of thing going on, but I think my argument about Jakob still stands quite strong just the fact that he he chose which competitions he wanted to enter which he felt he needed to enter he did them he won one of them got bronze in the other got bronze in the Olympics possibly at his last time of asking we'll see whether he goes to Paris but yeah for me I think he was the standout and I agree with what Tyler said about the whole cultural versus performance aspect I think for me Alberto didn't quite cut it, like thinking of, for the male performance of the year. And then, yeah, the speed climbers, I think I'd rather take them together as like a story rather than an individual. So I'll just stick with Jakob, I think. Yeah, I'm going to discount uh, Vedrik, and I'm sorry, Vedrik, I don't mean to, to sound rude in doing that, but simply because I don't think two events make a season. Um, they didn't even do the World Championships. And so for me, you know, easy win in Salt Lake, or easy, you know, him and his teammate in Salt Lake, of course the Russians weren't there. Um, so you only had half a field in a season that was so transiated that they didn't even give out an overall for it. So... You know, I think his performances were astonishing. Like, both of those Indonesian guys were raising the bar for speed. It was incredible. I would have loved to have seen five or six speed events across the year and seen how Dimitri Timothy even that could have responded because I think you would have had... I think it would have been a season for the ages, but sadly we only had, what was it, two World Cups and a, and a World Champs and... You had the Russians weren't in America, then you had the Indonesians weren't in world champs. And so it was like, we never actually got the showdown we wanted, except in Valar was probably the only time that they all came together. And they absolutely um, crushed the Russians in Villars, I'll say. 
well one <laughs> one comp i mean you know sure yeah i mean you know maybe the got, Russians. and also i think um and this goes contrary to your argument tyler so i apologize but this was an interesting season for speed not because they had more time to practice but because a lot of them had less time to practice because depending on lockdowns and stuff a lot of them didn't have regular access to walls they were having to train at home they weren't getting to run on the wall and in some countries they might have been able to practice in other countries they might have just been doing weights and stuff so i think that could have led to a disparity in results um maybe in a covid free world we would have had six or eight climbers globally in the 5-2 region in 2021. We will never know. Um, moving on to Alberto. Look, um, I argued for him in breakout because I think his performance was a breakout performance. I don't think a breakout performance dictates the top athlete of the year. So I, I agree pretty much with everyone here that that Olympic gold doesn't show the consistency required to be top dog. Um, for me, it's incredibly close between Jakob and Kokoro. Um, and I'm going with Kokoro because I'm sick of the dude being the bridesmaid. I think he was astonishing this year. He could only do well in what he could do well in. Uh, Olympics was never on the table for him or I'm sure he would have done well, because remember who won the Olympic qualifier in Toulouse? Oh, yeah, that's right, Kikuru, you know, the guy you forgot about. Um, you know, he beat a bunch of climbers that got to go to the Olympics, but because Japan's quota was full, he didn't get to go. Um, yeah, I just... I think he had one of those seasons that... Yeah, it's... It's so close between him and Jakob, but I'm giving it to Kokoro. All right, we didn't let's let, we didn't really figure out how we're going to handle a complete deadlock, did we? That's so, I, I honestly didn't expect from this. I thought we would that we'd be able to pick some people off. So I I I, I want to ask John uh, just because we started with you after hearing everybody go around the table. Where where do you fall? Dick, has has that changed your mind at all? Given three people say that we don't care about the Olympics. <laughs> I well here's the thing I it's like if you're if you're tied one of the ways to do it would be to just imagine going to your local climbing gym and saying like hey here are the four climbers which of them like had the better season I bet no offense to you know Kokoro but I'm I bet like m probably most people there would know of Alberto I I don't know if most of them would know Kokoro. I don't even know if most of them would know Jakob um, or the Indonesians. And and there is kind of when I'm when we're talking about the male or the female athlete of the year, I think there has to be kind of this intangible quality to them that maybe is something beyond just results. It, like they have transcended in some sense. And Alberto is a superstar. He he is. I mean he he told me. Um, when I talked to him, I talked to his team. He was trending number one on Twitter right after the Olympics. Like that's, that's legit. That's big stuff. And I know that like, it's hard. How do you compare that to like a world cup podium or something? You can't, you can't really compare them. It's not apples and oranges, but I do think it's okay to loop in these, these other aspects, even if we can't kind of put our finger on what that aspect is, um, I think that that kind of matters when you're talking about the male athlete of the year, the female athlete of the year, something like that. So, um, you know, I, it's hard for me to, it's hard. It, the big thing when I think of Jakob, okay, let's just compare Jakob to Alberto, because when I think of Jakob, the big thing I think about from his season, the big memorable moment was as Natalie said, that like third, you know, Olympics, that moment when he was like surprised and elated and his team was surprised Okay, that vault that he got, you know, an Olympic medal, and Alberto got the gold medal. So when I compare Alberto to Jakob, um, and which had the more memorable season, I kind of think it's Alberto. So I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know. 
This is this is I, a fascinating I think it, um, one for me. This is we've got a world champion, a world record holder, an Olympic gold medalist, and a and, and a and a like arguably the biggest legend on the men's circuit right now, right? Like in in Jakob. Yeah. So although most of that legend was built in seasons prior to 2021, yeah. so I have questions about that. But yeah, go ahead. I, I think it's well. I was just going to say I think it's amazing that Jakob is at such a level that he can have a season this good, which for most people would be absolute career season, life, you know, season of their life. And everyone's like, well, but is it as good as, you know, he could do because we've seen him do so many great things before that I think, like for me, I'm almost discounting Jakob because I feel that we weren't seeing Jakob peak at the right time. Whereas, I feel for Kokoro, we were seeing him absolutely peak it at the right time. Now, of course, Jakob had the problem that he had to peak for Olympics and then go to world champs and stuff. So it's like, to me, it's by far the hardest category because I could go, I could go either way, but I would not give it to Alberto um, simply because no one is going to remember combined climbing in the Olympics in 12 years time. It's going to be the tug of war. Um, it was doomed to anonymity the second they changed the the format for the next Olympics, because you 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 have no legacy if there's no repetition. And and that actually pains me to say because I think that's unfair on those athletes. But climbing is in the Olympics, but free discipline combined is a one one shot and gone. Yeah, yeah, but the thing is, Eddie, it's. Those are good points, but it's still going to be like in 2024 when it's just Boulder and lead. Is it going to be just, quote, sport climbing, like a sport climbing gold medal? Because then it will be the same medal lineage, even if it's not actually contested exactly the same way. I don't I don't know. Right. I'm, I'm willing to bet they call it sport climbing. I, I have no idea if their website is going to list it as like sport climbing 2020, 2024. Yeah. I, I got no freaking idea. So, so then to, to, to know for someone to like, that's pretty inside baseball then for somebody to say like, yeah, but 2020, like a hundred years from now when they're looking at the results and they're like, yeah, sport climbing, sport climbing. But 2024 was different than 2020. If they're both called sport climbing and it's the same metal lineage, I don't know if people will really delineate that scrupulously, you know? Um, so I don't know. Well, yeah. But this is where I say, because we don't know, I find it hard to vote for. And I'm over here arguing for the only person that's got two gold medals and a world record. All you guys are running around with like one gold medal and extenuating circumstances trying to figure out how nobody's on board with this. All right. At this point, we're, we're, I'm just going to ask you one more time who you think uh, your male athlete of the year is. And if there is a tie, we're going to open it up to the audience to give their opinions. Not that they're going to decide it because the internet's a disaster, but we'll just throw it out there. And if it's a tie, it's a tie. So I, I have to keep uh, Vedric Leonardo as, as my male competitor of the year. Um, uh, John, where do you stand? Nobody's, and I just, I, I think you might be muted, but I just want to yeah. say it's nobody's job here to break a tie, right? I, I want to genuinely know what you guys think. I would probably stick with Alberto, but I'm not sticking very, with my feet, like, firmly in the sand. Like, I'm kind of like you, Tyler. Like, I, this is a really hard one. And so... I'd probably stay with this Alberto, one's not hard but... for me. I'm 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 in it for uh, for I think it's a tight field, but I I'm very decisive on uh, on Vedric. <laughs> Eddie, what about you? Kikoro, the the only person close to Kikoro for me is Jakob. And yeah, Natalie. Yeah, let's <laughs> just give it to the audience. <laughs> there you go. Well, so. I entirely undecided. Maybe we'll just call it a four-way tie for, for male athlete of the year. Uh, rest in peace, Stefano Gizolfi and Sean Bailey, who probably could have broken this tie if we had them in the list, but whatever, they didn't make the cut for nominees. So uh, get wrecked. Um, let's, uh, well, I'll just say, please in the comments, uh, go to town on who you think was the male competitor of, uh, of the year. Um, we have one more category to go. I imagine this one will be easier than, uh, than this one. So it should go by. Pretty quick. Uh, the final award is Female Competitor of the Year. 
Uh, this one goes to the female competitor, irrespective of disciplines contested, judged to be the most outstanding over the 2021 season. And Eddie Falk has the honor of starting us off. All right. So let's play the game. Starts the season, wins the World Cup. That's number eight in a row. No climbers ever done that before. Then later in the season, wins World Cup number 31. No climbers ever done that before. In the history, more than 30 years of competition climbing, regardless of discipline or gender, no climbers won eight in a row. No climbers won 31 World Cups. Then goes three for three in the lead World Cup she enters. You know, a little mini season sweep. She didn't do all the comps, but all the comps she entered, she won. So that's fine. And oh, even though she didn't do all the comps, that was enough to win the lead overall. And then she had some spare time, so she went and won an Olympic gold and showed that the Olympics can occasionally get the right athlete on the top step of the podium. So my nominee for Climber of the Year, screw the gender, is Yanya Gambret. She was the climber of 2021. Best of luck to the rest of us trying to argue against that. Uh, John, you have to follow that. Sorry, bud. <laughs> well, here's how I would follow that. There's an old saying with writing you know, that your your protagonist is only as good as your antagonist, right? Or you might hear it said that the hero is only as good as the villain, or a story is only its, as good as its villain. I'm not here to say which one's the hero and which one's the villain. I don't think like, I'm, I'm not saying that, but... I do think that a big reason why Yanya's season was so exciting was because she did have this competitor who n not only was close to her, but as we saw, could actually be better than her in on, on a given day in Natalia Grossman. And so I think as great as Yanya was this season, the thing that really excites me and it, it, it going forward is that we, we have this awesome rivalry here uh, between Yanya and Natalia that I hope will continue into the coming seasons because it's great stuff. It's great theater. And I think back Tyler to you, when you've assessed the 2019 bouldering season um, that Yanya swept, one of the things you always say is this rhetorical question of, well, how good was the rest of the field that year? Was that, uh, you know, the world's, the, the history's best field? Probably not, to, not to take anything away from Yanya's accomplishment. But so Yanya didn't, I guess she kind of had Akio that year. Akio was kind of on her heels for a number of those competitions, but Akio never proved that she could beat Yanya that, that season, the 2019 season. Akio was always kind of that second place spot, the third place spot. This year, we actually had somebody who was in that second place, third place spot, but then proved they could overtake the queen on uh, if the conditions were right and the stars aligned and stuff like that. So um, I think you cannot talk about Yanya's season and how great Yanya was with al without also talking about her, whatever, protagonist, antagonist, however you want to frame it. So that's that would be my argument for Natalia. So your argument was she managed to beat her once. So she lost 87% of the time to Yanya, but 13% of the time she won. So therefore, I, I, and this is why, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to be a dick, but when you have a record like Yanya's, you know, Tyler said it going in, this is not a hard one. It, it's, it's, you know, I don't know what she'll have to do to get a Loris nomination, probably be a dude. But, like, she's so far ahead of the rest. I will leave any more discussion until until after we've all presented, and we can uh, we can debate that. Uh, but, Natalie, you're next. So, I'm going with Miho Nanaka, and she's had a bit more of a hero's journey with a few ups and downs to get to where she got to last year, which was a silver medal in Tokyo on home turf. She had a very consistent start to the season pre-Tokyo. She made 
all but one final in the World Cups. She got fifth, seventh, fourth and sixth in the Boulder World Cups. Very consistent. And then got a third in Salt Lake City in the speed, which was really impressive because not many boulderers and lead climbers who are mixing it in the medals also win speed World Cup medals. Um, then she came fifth in Innsbruck in lead, sixth in Boulder and memorably injured her knee <laughs> during that round. Um, just before the Olympics, everyone was concerned that she'd be out of the running. She wouldn't be able to take part or greatly like hamper her performance. And then in Tokyo, she manages to fight her way to a silver medal in front of a home crowd. And she also in the background was struggling with the stress of the court for arbitration for sport hearing like she didn't actually know that she was going to be competing in Tokyo because of the I'm not going to go into detail but the the mix up and the uncertainty around the Japanese spots for the Tokyo games um Miho was involved in that and if you watch the the wall film that sort of covers that partly and I think the fact that she managed to podium at a home games, um, given what she went through, was really impressive. I'm not saying she's on the same level as Yanya and Natalia, maybe, but yeah, I think she definitely deserves to be in the running. Well, I am arguing on behalf of Brooke Rabatu, and I'm going to tell you why she deserves to uh, uh, to beat Yanya uh, in this uh, in this award. First of all, she's the only contender on this list to. Uh, uh, attend both the Olympics and the world championships. She didn't wimp out uh, like someone like Yanya, for instance. And uh, given the opportunity that uh, Natalia didn't have, she still strove to attend as many events as possible and put up an honest fight in all of them. Uh, Brooke did manage to place in the single digits for every event that she competed in uh, this year. Um, And notably, the only time that she didn't finish in the single digits was at the Salt Lake City Speed World Cup, where she finished 12th. Uh, In that scenario, she beat Yanya Garnbrett uh, by, I think, about five seconds. Uh, Brooke, in that case, if I if I have this correct, Brooke was uh, had to go head to head in the eighth finals against Ola Miroslav, who ended up winning the speed event. So I can write off, you know, not winning that particular race. Yanya, on the other hand, somehow managed to lose to the Austrian Alexandra Elmer, who, uh, who has since gone on to do uh, not much. Uh, and so I think uh, by beating Yanya by five seconds in the eighth finals of the Salt Lake City speed event, ending 12th rather than Yanya's um, uh, negligible 15th, I think Brooke Ravitu is the female athlete of the year. End scene. Um, I, the first thing I want to talk about is with Natalia Grossman, is there is something to the fact that she won a medal if not two, at every single event she went to. And she went to a buttload of them. Um, I, I don't want to discount the importance of, of Yanya's strategic and successful push to the Olympics, which means you don't go to all events. But there is something remarkably uh, um, impressive about Natalia's performance through the season. It was nuts. Uh, I don't think... Um, uh, I think, what, did Natalia have one result? That was really off a podium this year. It was the what Innsbruck Lead World Cup. Was that right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think Yanya matches that in any season she's had. Um, that's that's like Liv Sanso's numbers, where you just like I live on the podium every everywhere I go. That's insane. But Eddie Eddie has the point that yes, Yanya does beat her ninety percent of the time so far. I I mean, you know what I'll say there is. Yanya was first or second at every comp she did this year, discounting speed. Mm-hmm. Um, or last year. Sorry. Where she was beat by Brooke Rabbit too that one time. Just keep, keep yeah, that, where she, keep that you know, in your mind. And, and this is where it's, you know, I think Natalia is an incredible story. I cannot wait to see what the future holds. Um, but sometimes I think we spend so much time looking at the future but we forget to recognize greatness at the time and we assume that well next year we can give her a lifetime achievement award or whatever whereas 
Yeah, like this year, like I think the whole class of top females, like, you know, Mio Nanaka's story is incredible. To get a, to have had podiums in all three disciplines, like that's actually, you know, it, not, not in a season, in a career to have podiums in all three disciplines, I think is unheard of. Um, and then, yeah, like... Brooke, I think, is such a rising force. I'm really curious to see what the future holds for her because I actually, to me, Brooke has exceeded my expectations of where she'd be in the journey, if that makes sense. Um, and I think the Brooke-Natalia dynamic is incredibly interesting because are they going to keep sucking the level up by being such good friends working together, blah, blah, blah. Or eventually are we going to have a schism where it gets competitive and gets a bit testy? Um, so I'm, I'm really curious. But in terms of quality, Yanya, in terms of have we got an awesome next five years? Yeah. I, I just wanted to clarify, does, does anybody have... Uh, um... Like Miho, I know she's got the she's got the bronze and speed and the boulder medals. Do, does she have a lead medal? Because I didn't think she did yet. I don't think she has a podium. I think so. Give me a second. I couldn't find anything. Maybe a finals, but okay. I don't, I don't I, have I, a podium yeah. yet. Not Maybe I'm wrong. I thought she did. I thought she had one. My bad. That's okay. But that would be exemplary. That would be. I think you you have to go back to pre homologated speed to find like the Salavat Rachmatovs. Uh. Olga Bibic, maybe yeah, just those you, two, yeah. And, and you're going back to traditional speed, classic yes. speed, not yeah, not modern format. Yeah. Uh, does anybody else have any uh, comments they want to bring before we take this to a vote? Um. Yeah, I think Brooke's really impressive, and I actually had her foot not slipped in Tokyo. I think she possibly could have made the medals in lead. I know it's not, we shouldn't talk about what might have happened, but I think she's definitely, along with Jan, um, Natalia, uh, I can't wait to see what those two do in, in Paris. Um, I really thought Brooke, and I, th and I think it took until Tokyo for Brooke to realise that she had the potential to medal. She qualified really highly for the finals and had a, an amazing bold around and then just sadly that foot slip in the in the lead um so i can see arguments for all four women or especially yanya natalia and brooke um but i think i agree with eddie with the whole you know yanya doesn't really get the praise that she deserves which sounds crazy because everyone's like oh she's the goat or whatever but then when it comes to these big awards she doesn't seem to get recognized she doesn't seem to get put forward and maybe it's because are we bored of her winning or something maybe it's just become a bit too commonplace but yeah maybe we need to just slow down and give her the recognition she deserves so yeah i'll go with yanya yeah my my vote is with yanya um i i am willing to be uh, a stickler for if we're going to hand out titles like greatest of all time i re would really like people to do the work and explain why that's such a big deal um, so, so I, I try not to make it sound like I have too much issue with her as an athlete because I don't, but that is the most valuable title you can give to anybody in sport. Um, and I might be taking my time getting my thoughts together on this, but it looks like if nobody else is going to write the profile comparing her against all the climbers in history, then it might have to be me, which will take forever because I'm slow, slow at writing. But I do think she is, uh, if not the greatest of all time, given at least uh, one or two more seasons she could be. That's just based on my own personal criteria, which you don't have to uh, abide by. But this season was incredible. Gold's in, in, uh, in lead and bouldering winning the season off of just three events straight which was uh i think unheard of um and then of course winning the olympic gold which she had all the pressure in the world to do uh it was a knockout season it was very convincing um she's my she's mine all the way i i i would choose yanya too no, no question about it i the greatest of all time thing i know we we keep circling back to it because it's a fun discussion i do think the Olympic gold 
kind of adds a lot of weight to her in that discussion of greatest of all time. Uh, even even though she does not have the the I don't know quantity of World Cup medals in each individual discipline as other competitors in the past. I think the fact that after 2021 she does add an Olympic gold medal to her accomplishments. I think that counts for a lot. Same reasons that I talked about Alberto. I think going forward, that's only going to count for even more as people look at the history of climbing in the Olympics years from now, decades from now. Um, so, yeah, Yanya. Yeah, I, I'm going to bring out one stat about Yanya, which I forgot. She's 22. <laughs> yeah, it's because we so often we put her on the same page as Jane Kim Akio Noguchi, um, we look at historical figures like Sandrine LeVay, people like that, and we're, we're measuring them across the scope of their career that they've got 14, 15 years to achieve what they've done. And Yanya turns 23 next month. Um, you know, she's got so much in front of her still if she chooses to pursue it. Um, and I am also going to give an honorary shout out sorry my vote is Yanya <laughs> but I'm going to give an honorary shout out to who I feel is the overlooked climber this year because or last year sorry because she just didn't do enough is Che and so I am really you know we, and I feel I need to say this because I painted the story of the brook and Natalia dynamic and I don't want to seem that I'm not giving respect to Che and so to Aimori, to that caliber of climber. I think the next few years, it's because you've still got the the established legends, and then you got these new kids. It's going to be pretty brutal. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Does anybody have any closing comments? Anybody want to change their mind on male competitor of the year, or are we <laughs> are we locked in in deadlock? Everybody good? Any last words? I do feel like we should we can end with a four-way tie now but we should remedy it somehow at some point because i think going forward especially if we want to do these awards year after year we don't want to have a, a four-way tie for the for this year's male athlete of the year i think we need to somehow maybe it's just crowdsourcing maybe it's people vote for it in the comments i don't know so but... I'll, I'll be honest i think i think in my, my personal preference is i would rather keep the voting to people who I know have watched every comp and who are relatively informed uh, and who I think do their best to judge this uh, based on merit. And if it ends in a deadlock because I was dumb enough to choose a panel of four people, uh, then you say, well, for this year, it was a four-way tie. And I think that has more merit than saying, congratulations, um, Alberto I... Inez Lopez, for instance, wins this because YouTube voted for that i don't know i don't that's I, yeah. I i i really recoil from that yeah sure i i agree and i actually have a solution uh oh <laughs> um <laughs> which is we've all given our number one picks i think we need to give our picks one through four and if we go 10 points for one eight for two six for three, four for four, we all give our picks and then we see who has the most points at the end. What if, what if we just did four points or what if we just did one point for first place, two for second, third for fourth, third for third and fourth for fourth and whoever has the fewest points. Does that make sense? Uh, Does that add up? Are, are, we, are we adding or multiplying? I just need to check in terms of <laughs> uh, my story. We're, 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 doing, um, we're, we're doing a square root times a square root <laughs> divided by. We're doing the, the lead. Okay, okay cool. So, I'm down so for one, this if you guys are one, down. Does so everybody so, have yeah. a piece of paper and we're just gonna we're gonna write our four and then I'll pull a table up? All right. I, so it, it was uh let's be it, it was paper, I'm just gonna call it. It was Alberto, Jakob, Kokoro, and uh Vidric. Vidric. Okay, gotcha. So let me just put a table together here.
the excitement, the drama. This is like a comp. <laughs> this is like a competition within the. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm done mine. Uh, I don't know what what order we want to do this in. Um, I'm happy to start, uh, and then as you guys read yours, I can uh, start adding these up. Uh, so anyway, I'll go first. Uh, my first place is uh, Vedric Leonardo, who won the most gold medals, won the world, uh, or sorry, uh, broke the world record. Second place for me is Kokoro Fuji, uh, based off of high level consistency and a world championship win. Third place, Alberto Hines Lopez uh, for winning the Olympics. And third place, or pardon me, fourth place is Jakob Schubert uh, for coming third in the Olympics, albeit he did have a very good uh, uh, season for both of them. The ultimate prize was obviously the Olympics, and Alberto happened to win it. Uh, who's next? John. All right, I've got um, Alberto is my pick. Below him, I have Kokoro, and then... Below that, I have Jakob, and then last but not least, I have Vedrik. All right. Who's next? Mm, mine is the inverse of Tyler's. Which just kind Are you of... guys kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> this is like Wordle, but it's yeah. Right. <laughs> All right, we'll get there. Okay. Jakob, Alberto, Kokoro, and Vedrik. Okay. And Eddie. I okay. feel like Alberto, like he did have quite a consistent season. Like he was making some finals and World Cups, not doing very well. But it was like maybe that counts for something with the gold medal. <laughs> yeah, mine is Kokoro, Jakob, um, Vidrik, and then Alberto. Alberto yeah. fourth, cool. Mm -hmm. So. I think it's Jakob. I, I think it's Kokoro. Yeah, maybe. Just doing the quick maths. I'm, I'm going to complain about the scoring system if it's not who I want it to be. <laughs> you won't be complaining, Eddie. Uh, so it looks like Vedrik takes last place. Uh, uh, tied, tied for second slash third are Alberto and Jakob. And first place is Kokoro Fuji. <laughs> So yeah. according <laughs> according to this math, which I will take I will take as legit because I think that's a, uh, that's basically how we picked our nominees. Frankly, so it's effectively the same system. Uh, so anyway, our uh, our 2021 male competitor of the year is Kokoro Fuji. Congratulations, Kokoro, uh, and and way to way to solve the problem, Eddie, on the fly. Can you imagine watching a YouTube video where people just do some mental math for a second and just don't talk at all for a little bit and you just wait for the bad numbers? What a disaster. Anyway. I tried to introduce conversation, but I was like, then do I interrupt you from the math and it takes longer? Or... No, it's all good. The computer I, did it I, I thought maybe, maybe we should ask if math has an S on it. Is it math? I don't know. Don't even, get, don't even get started. You guys, you guys are, are no. Uh, well, let's a quick summary. Oriane Berton is the breakout, or pardon me, is the rookie of the year for 2021. Natalia Grossman is the breakout of the year for 2021. Kokoro Fuji is the male uh, competitor of the year, and Yanya Garnbrett is the female competitor of the year. This was a lot of fun. The nominations process by itself was kind of fun and goofy, uh, but this show actually went much better than I thought. So I just want to thank all three of you. Um, I know uh, Natalie is is nearing midnight. Eddie probably wants to go back to bed, uh, joining from Edinburgh and uh, and where Auckland, respectively. I can't remember uh, where you're at, Eddie. I, I'm up north. I'm um, in the area called Northland, middle of nowhere, next to a beach, just rehabbing my leg. Doesn't doesn't sound like that bad a life. Up north when you're that far south must be pretty... Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Up, pretty, up north is, clo is, <laughs> is closer to the tropics. Sorry. So, yeah, yeah. It's all good. Yeah, other side of the world. So when I say up north, I mean closer to the tropics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, of course, John and I in the eastern uh, time zone just hiding from the snow. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I hope you enjoyed watching this show. Uh, of course, this season, we're going to be running the debrief after every competition, hopefully. Uh, and hopefully, we'll actually get to see some of each other at World Cups this year. Uh, we'll see what, what plays out. Maybe, uh, maybe we can uh, uh, have a drink and actually get to 
to meet one another in person. For the rest of you, thanks for watching. Make sure you like and subscribe to Plastic Weekly to see when our next episode comes out. If you're interested, you can support the show on Patreon or you can join our Discord in the link below to talk about comps as they happen and learn more about competitive and climbing culture. So thanks again, and we'll see you in the next one.